Soren Kierkegaard was both a romantic and a theologian, and this is a very volatile mixture. He was a religious philosopher and also a bitter, ironic humorist who wrote a body of work that stands more, rather halfway between literature and philosophy. It's sometimes difficult with particularly, with particularly inventive writers to tell exactly what genre we would like to assign them to. My inclination would be to say that Kierkegaard is a theologian with the soul of a poet and the analytical abilities of a philosopher. And bringing all these together at a time when, Engli when deism has collapsed and the Enlightenment hope that religion and reason could be reconciled means that he is standing at a pivotal point in the history of Western thought and Western theology. And for better or worse, there are few people with the same degree of religious intensity as Kierkegaard. If you know the history of Western thought and you are familiar with the work of Pascal, or if you're familiar with the work of Tertullian, you will have some idea of the depth and fanaticism, if you will, of Kierkegaard's commitment. Pascal anguished and, uh, anguished and seeking for a way out of this world gave everything to his religious commitment. Tertullian, the great father of the church, said, I believe because it is absurd. Well, pa uh, Kierkegaard's thinking is very much along those lines. He is a romantic who is willing to forsake the tradition of Western rationality and Western science and the whole Athenian tradition because he feels that it has corrupted the tradition of Western religion and Christianity has been gradually eroded by the inclusion of certain rational tendencies which are derived from Greek philosophy. Now, he himself was a very, very peculiar individual. Like so many romantic writers, he had a troubled personal life, and his psyche was constantly the scene of intense strain and torment and anguish, a characteristic stance for romantic writers. If you know the work of, of Keats or Shelley or Byron, romantic difficulties mean psychic tension, psychic problems, which are manifest themselves in different ways in their work. Well, Kierkegaard's manifestations of his psychic difficulties of his own personal spiritual journeys comes out in some very peculiar ways. In the first place, he insisted that truth is subjectivity, which is a remarkable idea, and his work in this respect is a precursor to existentialism. He says that you ultimately cannot reconcile religious belief and reason, and reason will not be a satisfactory guide for the conduct of your life. He is going to turn his back on the traditions of the Enlightenment and try and form a new connection between deep subjectivity and powerful passion and religious belief. In other words, what he's doing is abandoning the project of the Enlightenment and trying to ask some new questions about theology and philosophy, and these new questions will take us in a different direction from the rather sterile uh, domain of deism. Now, not only did he say that truth was subjectivity, he himself was a rather protean figure. He used to write his books almost exclusively under pseudonyms, and the pseudonyms were very peculiar. Um, they were things like Victor Eremita, which means Victor the Hermit, or someone like Anticlimacus, which means anti-climax. He has constant repertoire of personae that he puts on, and all of them are ironic and rather troubling and very peculiar. And what's even more troubling and peculiar about Kierkegaard's work is that after he published his pseudonymous books, he used to review his own books pseudonymously in the newspapers. And he used to give them bad reviews. Now this is surely a very peculiar individual. He has some uncertainty as to what his identity really is, or perhaps he is trying to suggest that identity is not as fixed as we may suspect. There's more than one way of reading that. This fruitful, fertile ambiguity is characteristic of romantic writers, and when romantic writers move from the domain of lyric poetry and uh, uh, novels like Frankenstein or the, the, the sonnets of Keats, to the domain of religion, the result is very volatile indeed, and some of the output of Kierkegaard is unparalleled for its caustic, ironic bitterness, and at the same time, a strangely good-natured sense of humor. Kierkegaard himself was a, a very peculiar individual. In some ways, he's almost a caricature of the romantic writer. The, the way in which he departs from most of the romantics is that he is highly ascetic and primarily concerned with the next world, not with this world. Unlike most romantics, he, is not in, he does not favor 
emotion for its own sake. He favors it as a way of breaking the bounds of rationality and giving the soul direct access to God. Um, Kierkegaard turned down, a, he was engaged to be married, and for no obvious reason turned down his wonderful fiance. Of course, he was doing this fiance the best turn that had ever been done to her. But he turned her down and refused to marry her because he felt that it would bring him into the domain of this world. It would endanger his spiritual path. So he decided to wander alone like the rhinoceros for the whole of his life. And this woman went on and left him, of course, but the fact that he had been engaged and had nearly connected with other human beings and then decided to go and be a a strictly isolated individual, tells us something about him. On his tombstone, and Kierkegaard was the sort of person that would dwell on the question of what will be on his tombstone while he is yet alive. That was the kind of thing that would entertain Kierkegaard. He didn't want a name or dates of birth and death or anything directly religious. All he wanted to put on his tombstone was the statement, that individual. Here lies Soren Kierkegaard, that individual. Yes, he is a truly romantic man. He is not going to be a cogitator, a cog in a giant uh, logical wheel. He will be an individual at all costs. The path to, towards God turns out to be the path towards the self. What Kierkegaard is doing is saying that we never completely move in the direction of God until we have God's unbought and unaccountable grace. And prior to that, while we are in this world, our identities, like the world around us, are in flux and there is nothing we can count on. There is nothing we can be certain of. Now, this general mood of melancholy, of isolation, and of individuality are all main themes in Romanticism, which are given a very peculiar theological twist in his writings. And some of the titles of the books are, are quite repellent. They would push you back from, you wouldn't even open them. Um, perhaps you're familiar with a book called Sickness Unto Death. That's a real page turner, isn't it? That's a great a bestseller. How about Fear and Trembling? Or perhaps The Concept of Dread? Yes. Kierkegaard was relentlessly negative, but at the same time ironically humorous. There is an odd juxtaposition of opposites in his writing. And you would expect a man who was fervent in his religious belief and who thought that the rest of Western culture had gone wrong because they had not maintained this pure fidelity to the gospel. You would expect that he might have a positive, affirmative, life-giving kind of stance towards the world? No. He is relentlessly caustic and he is one of the great critics in the history of the West. He said that he described himself as a missionary. Right? Now he lived all his life in Denmark, right? So the idea of being a, a missionary in a society that has had Christianity for a great many centuries and is one of the centers of Lutheranism is a very peculiar idea, but he said he thought it was necessary for us to bring Christianity to Christendom. And that's the kind of missionary that he was. He said, fine, I could be a missionary right here. I don't need to go to some place that hasn't heard of Christianity because none of you have. <laughs> so again, it's funny, but it's also bitter and caustic at the same time. It's a very strange melange of, of, of words. And the, the protean tendencies of Kierkegaard move us in the direction of knowledge. They cannot give us knowledge itself. Only an Enlightenment thinker would, be, would think that you could write down a proof or a series of logical cogitations and then you would be able to move people in the direction of re religion. He says no, he's going to make an attack on this world and show you how vacant and bankrupt and unhappy the present age is. The book I want to focus on in the course of this lecture is called The Present Age. And as you might expect, Kierkegaard is none too happy about the present age. On the other hand, had he been born in this year or had he been living in this year, he wouldn't have been happy with this age either. He was the sort of man man that was always born out of time, and he would have been unhappy with any age. Now, he is exceedingly poetic, and, he, and in some respects he reminds me of Meister Eckhart with a certain sort of negativity attached to it, because both of them are at bottom mystics, and in, in addition to being mystics, he said that without risk there is no faith, there is no rational royal road to divinity. If you want to be a religious believer, you must take upon yourself the fact that A, it is never going to make sense, not now, not later on. It's not that some great philosopher a hundred years or a thousand years from now is going to figure out some fine proof and will justify your religious faith now. Faith 
has no justification. If you have a faith that you believe you have derived from some axioms or you have extrapolated from some religious, uh, from some philosophical stance, in fact, that's not the real religious faith. The real religious faith is always going to entail risk. This, lo this longing for certainty that we get from the tradition that comes out of Athens is not part of Christianity. Man, uh, man proposes, but God disposes, and it turns out that we will never have certainty in a rational sense. If we have any direct and fixed connection to the, to the deity, we will do so on the basis of God's grace, and we will intuit this. We will have a feeling about this. He says that one of the things that is wrong with this age is that it lacks faith. It not only lacks faith, but it lacks even passion, and passion is a necessary precondition for faith. You rational people, you people with the souls of accountants, I'm afraid, are trying to add up and subtract your way to God, and that is not how you will do it. You will do it only by making a leap of faith, by taking a chance. This idea of taking risks is very much continuous with the general stance that the Romantics had. He has just given it a strange kind of twist by bringing it in exclusively within the domain of theology. Now, in his book Fear and Trembling, Kierkegaard writes with particular bitterness and particular acrimony about what he calls the aesthetic reading of the Bible. He says, look, those of you children of the Enlightenment, those of you spiritual citizens of Athens who believe that the Bible can be read as a beautiful set of stories and nothing else, that in fact it would be satisfactory to think of the symbolism behind the parables rather than the actual literal miracles there, you do not have real Christian faith. This aesthetic reading of the Bible is in fact an erosion from within and what it does is steal the marrow of religion. In some respects he has a, a similar stance to Swift but without the same degree of heavy handedness in Swift. He can be strident and caustic but in a much more deft way. Now Kierkegaard, because he is a romantic, moving into the domain of theology, he generates some new questions that had not been part of the set of, uh, of the kind of inquiries in theology and philosophy being done during the Enlightenment. And these questions are pregnant with the greatest and deepest problems for us today as well. Uh, a couple of them are worth looking at. In the first case, he asks a very pointed question when he inquires into the nature of conscience and its connection to our understanding of the Bible. He says this, is our conscience the standard by which we judge the Bible? In other words, if we find something in the Bible that we disapprove of, are we then to say that the Bible is mistaken or wrong, or are we trying to, to wiggle out of our problem by allegorizing and symbolizing the biblical story? Or is the proper answer to say, no, the Bible is the source from which we derive our conscience. And if our conscience tells us that the Bible is wrong, that just shows us what wicked worms we are. Because we have God's divine revelation here, and if our conscience is inconsistent with that, then we're merely wrong. Go back. The, Kierkegaard's favorite book of the Bible, Job. All right? And if you know the book of Job, then you have some idea of the depth and profundity and excessive qualities of this faith. Well, Kierkegaard forces us to think our way through this problem. And he says the only truly Christian stance is not this hubristic, arrogant idea that we will correct God and his divine revelation. If, for example, we look at uh, something like the story of Abraham and Isaac, well, there are two ways we can take that. If you think about a man, if suppose a man came to you, suppose he was named Abraham and said, recently I had a visit from the divinity and I was told that I have to sacrifice my son. Well, you might be inclined to think that that was an immoral action. And any rational person would say that, well, you're probably crazy because you think God talks to you directly. And the idea of killing your son, most immoral. In this world of space and time, in our lives, we would certainly think that was bad. If your neighbor came up to you and said that, you would look at him very strangely. Now Kierkegaard says, well, that's just fine, provided you're an Athenian. That's just fine, provided you're trying to make rational sense. But Kierkegaard was, or rather, uh, um, Kierkegaard was trying to point out that Abraham is a hero of faith. And what is heroic about Abraham is that he was willing to sacrifice his son. Remember that God sends the angel down to stop him, but the point is to find out whether Abraham judges the world and, and the behavior in this world on the basis of what God reveals to him or on the basis of his own unguided conscience. If he were to do this on the basis of his own unguided conscience, he would never kill his son. What's great about Abraham is the fact that his faith runs so deep that it includes things that make no sense whatever. 
Can you see how this is a romantic rejection of rationality in spades? What's great about the sacrifice of Isaac is that it makes no sense. If it made sense, then we could probably include it within the Greek domain and it wouldn't really be a test of faith. The real test of faith is, are you willing to abandon even your own individual conscience if that's what scripture or the deity demands of you? And that is an agonizing kind of decision, and it's not entirely clear how we want to deal with it. On the one hand, I would be inclined to say that I feel that we ought some way to be able to finesse scripture in, in order to make it consistent with our intuitions that der we derive from conscience. On the other hand, I suppose that in a way he is right. There is no way rationally that we can justify something like Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac, and this is a paradigmatic test of faith. If the Bible tells us that Abraham is a very virtuous man, Kierkegaard says, Abraham is a very virtuous man. And if what he did doesn't make any sense, well, then he's still a virtuous man. And if not only did it not make sense, but it was absolutely immoral by any rational or human standard, he says, that's the acid test of real religious faith. Are you willing to go beyond the domain of mere rationality? It's an either-or question. You can't fudge it. You have to say yes or no. And this is what Kierkegaard is trying to force Western culture into. He's trying to force Western culture into a binary opposition, either or. Either the life of religious faith or the life of secular, this-worldly skepticism. But you can't have it both ways, and you can't mix the two. If you try and mix any amount of this-worldly rationality with God's revealed religion, it is either superfluous or it's wrong. What that means is, is that, that that wishbone that I had talking about, that I talked about when I lectured about deism, splits in half. And Kierkegaard says, good riddance. Let us get rid of this Athenian tradition. Let us get rid of rationality. God didn't tell Abraham to think a lot about what he was ordered to do. He told him to do it. Here we have what we would, what might be called blind faith, but what Kierkegaard calls a leap of faith. It is a decision that people have to make, and a decision that cannot be avoided, and it is a decision that is criterionless. And this is very important because Kierkegaard is often thought of as one of the precursors of 20th century existentialism. And the reason why he is thought so is because he said, look, you cannot ultimately justify your stance as being a citizen of Athens or a citizen of Jerusalem. I'm just able to show you that you have to be one or the other. You can't be both. You can't have dual citizenship. Kierkegaard has decided that he can show you that that's impossible. So now you must make a choice. And the difficulty is, is that any justification you would give for being a spiritual citizen of, of Jerusalem or being a spiritual citizen of Athens presupposes what it's trying to prove. If you assume that it's very important to be rational, it's very easy to show later on that it's, it makes sense to be a spiritual citizen of Athens, and you, you have to give up on certain parts of the tradition of biblical religion. On the other hand, if you presuppose that biblical religion is all important and religious faith is what frees you and saves you, then it's possible to show that Athens is full of arrogant, hubristic men, and the tradition that comes out of Jerusalem is exactly the right one you ought to be following. But Kierkegaard says, without presupposing any of that, how would you show that either choice was better or worse? And if you can't do that without presupposing one or the other, you're simply being dishonest. You must make this choice, and you have been given no standard by which to make it. So now you must make the existential choice, and everything in your life is going to depend on this, and God has given you no guide. If God, through his own mysterious activity, gives you the grace to believe, then you will believe. If he does not, then I'm afraid you must wander alone in a wilderness of nature and rationality, which can only lead to despair. The only possible recourse for human beings, the only source of their hope, will be making this criterionless choice, this choice between either Athens or Jerusalem, but not both. And Kierkegaard says, the time has come for us to grow up and face that fact. All the optimistic ideas of the Enlightenment, of reconciling faith and reason, are ultimately a way of blinding yourself to what you must decide. You must decide the same way that Abraham did. In a way, we are all put in the position of Abraham. So not only is that a paradigmatic test of faith, but is a test that repeats itself again and again and again in human life. We will be forced to sacrifice things of this world for which we might have a great liking. We will not be giving them up because they are not pleasant. We will not be giving them up because reason demands that we not. Rather, we will be giving them up because God tells us we must. And that is a very different kind of rationale.
Now, Kierkegaard does the best he can to make Revelation intellectually respectable, but he's not going to try the affirmative way of the medieval scholastic theologians who tried to prove God's existence, like St. Anselm, who said, God is that which nothing greater can be conceived, and tried to derive God's necessary existence from that. Kierkegaard, being a negative thinker, is going to go the other way. Kierkegaard is going to try and say, well, what if it turns out that in, that the acceptance of revelation is on a par, at least as intellectually respectable as the exception of, as accepting reason as our only guide. That's as close as we'll ever be able to come, this kind of Mexican standoff between Athens and Jerusalem. And that's what he's going to argue for. In a book called Philosophical Fragments, which is, one of, which is not fragmentary, it's about 600 pages. Again, there's something ironic about writing a book that's called Fragments that goes on and on and on interminably. It's the kind of, of bizarre and perverse sort of sense of humor you would see in Kierkegaard. But in the course of, of philosophical fragments, he asks some questions about Socrates in the Mino. Now, Kierkegaard wrote his doctoral dissertation on, on Socrates and strictly on Socratic irony, which would be characteristic of, of Kierkegaard if you think about it. What would attract him in Socrates is not certainty or rationality or the philosopher king. It would be the re repeat and unavoidable irony, the irony layered upon irony, upon irony. He wrote an ironic dissertation about Socratic irony, and when it was passed at the university, his, the teachers that supervised it said, this is just fine, we will accept it, but please don't ever write anything for us again. Because it was just too excruciating to read. Well, in Philosophical Fragments, Kierkegaard starts to look at Socrates, and particularly looks at the Mino. Now, those of you that know Socrates' Mino, um, know it to be a, a dialogue about knowledge, and in that dialogue, Socrates makes the argument, perhaps it is an ironic argument, and this is what Kierkegaard believes, he makes the argument that, that all knowledge is but recollection. Socrates, for his own uh, philosophical reasons, needs to believe that everyone is born omniscient, that you know everything but you've forgotten, and then you gradually relearn it. Well, Kierkegaard said, what if that's wrong? What if we are born ignorant? And what if we can only get insight into the nature of human life and into the human condition by having this revealed to us? Well, if it has to be revealed, who can reveal it? Certainly not another human being, because they will have the same problem that we do. They will be born ignorant just like us. So the only way that if revelation is possible, and if, we, if all knowledge is not recollection, if Socrates is wrong, then revelation is the only possible avenue to real knowledge. And revelation cannot be the product of any other human being, because they will have the same problem as us. Thus it is proven, if Socrates is wrong, either no knowledge of any kind exists, or what knowledge does exist is revelation. Who could reveal it to us? Not man, only God. Who might that be? Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. So Kierkegaard is not trying to make an affirmative argument showing that thus it is proven, uh, Jesus is the Lord and Savior and revelation is true. He is trying to say that it is not intellectually disrespect, uh, 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 not res uh, disrespectable to believe in revelation because it stands on the same level as Greek rationality, and this is a concession that none of the Enlightenment thinkers were willing to make. He forces this out of them, and that is one of the great achievements in his 600 pages of fragments. Now, let's move to his send-up of the present age, titled, oddly enough, The Present Age. Kierkegaard has a whole list of romantic complaints about the present age, and he has decided that what is most lacking here is moral commitment. The problem is, is that the rise of modernity has generated large anonymous societies dominated by the machine and all the implications of the age of the machine for Western society, and that as a result, we have gradually become more mechanical and more paltry and more insipid and more inhuman as a result. And here he's giving the theological twist on the common uh, intellectual t temper tantrum of the romantics, industrial society is bad. All romantics hate machines and all of them hate uh, the consequences of machines, um, industrial poverty, large slums, ghettos, you can think of Dickens or Blake, or so many romantics hate the age of the machine. Well, Kierkegaard is no exception, but what he hates about it is not the fact that it produces social dislocation and, and produces a starving children like we find in Dickens' novels. His big problem with it is that it removes passion from people. It makes us more and more prosaic and more and more mundane. As he says, an age without passion lacks 
values. And we, because we lack any passion, we don't feel the impetus to go and find the, the answer to the, to the questions that life presents us with. We don't want to ask or answer the ultimate questions. We don't care enough about ultimate questions and answers to bother with them. We'd rather, we'd rather think about MTV. We'd rather think about the day-to-day -day existence that we have to and eke out. In other words, Kierkegaard says, uh, as it says in the Gospel, my kingdom is not of this world. This world you have created is a Babylon. It is a profane city. Kierkegaard, as he says, is going to introduce Christianity to Christendom. In addition to stopping the erosion of Christianity, he wants to roll back the tide and show that the entire tradition of Athens has been a mistake, and that what is, large, what is most wrong with the tradition of Western philosophy is that it has tried to create a rapprochement between the two. No compromise as far as he is concerned. He wishes to drive Athens out. As Tertullian said, I believe because it is absurd. Well, Kierkegaard, in a way, believes because it is absurd. If you believe because it made sense, Sense, it really wouldn't be religious faith because all faith demands risk. If you could work it out as a mathematical certainty, there would be no virtue to such a faith. God didn't ask Abraham to figure out whether sacrificing Isaac was a good idea. God told him what to do and he did it. That is the paradigm of the religious man. And it's an either or question. You go this way or you go that way. He takes his argument a little bit further, and he says that resentment, the hatred of superiority, the hatred of achievement, the hatred of excellence, is going to be a part of this erosion of Christianity and this lack of moral commitment, this decline of passion. All you're going to have is people who are envious of those few who ever get anything done, and they will do their best to badmouth that, and will do their best to impose a conception of right and wrong that reduces all questions to um, to utility, to voting by the mass of people, and to an insipid mediocrity. Kierkegaard, remember, wanted to be buried and have on his tombstone that individual. He did not want mediocrity. He did not want to follow the herd. He did not want to do what made sense because he disdained making sense. He said, I have a wisdom here that goes beyond mere rationality. And if you cannot bring yourself to believe that, then that's your problem, not mine. You deserve to live in an age like this. He says that one of the problems that we're going to get with the rise of democratic political movements in the age of the machine and the advent of modernity is that everyone's going to be chattering all the time and saying nothing. Talk, talk, talk. Loquacity destroys speech. All we're going to do is constantly be gossiping about nothing. We're never going to ask or answer the big questions in life. He makes a very pointed remark, and I've always had it stuck in my brain because I think it's probably true. People that do not know how to remain silent do not know how to talk. That's a remarkable observation, worthy of any of the greatest romantic poets. And the problem with it is that however crazy Kierkegaard is, that's probably true. He says these people constantly chattering, constantly talking about nothing. I have a few things to say, but I'm going to say them and then depart. I will remain as enigmatic to you as I am to myself. Now, he presents us with, I would say, the greatest of the romantic criticisms of the connection between Athens and Jerusalem. In the present age, he argues that the first part of the 19th century is paltry, that, you would, that, that the people around him would not know how to be very good or very evil. The tiny size of your soul precludes you from, any, from doing any big sin. You haven't gotten to the point where you could sin on any kind of scale. So you are incapable of doing good, incapable of doing evil. You are truncating the domain of the psyche to this tiny fragment of what you could be. The problem is that you are not willing to make the leap of faith which would allow you to be a whole and integrated soul because the leap of faith costs not less than everything. You have to be willing to put up everything in this wager. And unlike Pascal's wager, it's not merely that this is a good idea because the odds are with you. Here, you have no grounds for making the judgment. It's criterionless. It's like uh, spinning the roulette wheel, putting your money on either red or black, but you have no way of knowing in advance whether it's going to come up red or black at the end. You take your best chance, you, you take a shot at your best hunch, that's all you're ever going to get.
Can you see how that's going to generate a certain kind of internal anxiety which can only manifest, manifest itself in very peculiar ways? For example, breaking off his engagement or writing books which are extremely repellent or writing them under pseudonyms and then criticizing them under pseudonyms in public. Obviously, this is a tortured individual. He's in some ways a modern day Job. He comes as close to an absolute religious faith as we are ever going to see. In a book called Edifying Discourses, one, of, one, one section of which is dedicated to the book of Job, he, he talks about Job as the personification of faith. And he says the best thing about Job is that he understands that all theology is blasphemy. Which is a very deep thought as well. If it is true that our language will not accommodate the divinity, if it is true that we lack the tools to undertake that job, and we occasionally do succumb to the temptation to write and speak and think about theology, perhaps what we are doing then is raising our own selves to the status where we can claim to understand God, and not only understand Him, but explain Him to other people. Kierkegaard says, nay, if you believe that, you have not reached the real pinnacle of religious faith. If you remember the three friends of Job who tried to explain to him some kind of theological uh, account of why evil should enter the world and why he should be punished, and Job insisted to the end that no, none of these accounts are satisfactory, well, it turns out that Kierkegaard says, yes, if you are a theologian, you are wrong. You are one of those people that was, uh, is, was in the stance of Job's friends. The right stance for the true believer to be in is Job. Don't curse God and die. Take whatever God dishes out, because the only stance for the true believer is to be God's faithful servant. You shall not judge the Lord your God. He doesn't want your advice. Now, beyond these edifying discourses and beyond his treatment of Abraham and the sacrifice of, or, and the near sacrifice of his son, he insisted that philosophy and Christianity can never be united. And because philosophy and Christianity can never be united, all of the tradition of Western theology is essentially a wrong turn. He is, in fact, as much of an individual as he suggests with his tombstone, because if he is right, then virtually all of the great theologians, virtually all of the great philosophers in the Western tradition have been wrong. And he says either or. I am not afraid of being in the minority. He has obviously gotten a tremendous dose of religious faith, but in addition to that, he says that, well, the only way that I can express my individuality in this century, the only way that I can be the man that God has appointed me to be, is to sacrifice myself for you. Some men are going to be broken on the rock of an impossible virtue. And in fact, that is what's happening to Kierkegaard. He, I don't know that he raises himself to the status of a prophet, but one, all, all, one certainly gets the sense that he understood sense himself to be divinely inspired somehow. This divine inspiration is of a kind of left-handed tendency. It moves to the dark and to the negative and to the difficult, but he has what seems to be a genuine inspiration nonetheless. And he says, here's how it's going to work for you. In this modern age or in any age, you're going to have to solve the problem of human life and you're going to have to make a decision. The leap of faith is going to be forced upon you. If you do not make it, you choose this world. In other words, you cannot avoid the leap of faith. We would avoid it if we could. You must decide one way or another to take this criterionless choice. And he says the Lutheran alternative will not work. And that's quite surprising. If you think about Luther and his emphasis on faith alone, you might say that, you, that Kierkegaard would find Luther quite a congenial uh, intellectual comrade. But no, Kierkegaard thought Luther was soft. He wasn't really dug into religious faith because although that he emphasized the importance of faith and salvation, had that Augustinian tradition of piety, the problem with Luther from Kierkegaard's perspective is that he tries to make Christianity completely inward. He says that there's no necessary connection between faith and works. Kierkegaard says, a doctrine of works by itself is obviously unacceptable, but Luther's doctrine of pure faith is also unacceptable. He wants the whole package. When you make this leap of faith, it must transform your whole life. And when it transforms your life, you will have faith and you will be saved, but not by faith alone. You will also be saved by your activities in the world. You must do both in order to be saved. The truly righteous, the truly blessed man will not be under a covenant of works or a covenant of faith. He will unify them both into one perfectly Christian life. He is surely 
not expecting that we will become perfect. What he is expecting is that we will sacrifice everything in our attempt, asymptotic as it is, to achieve a perfection which is actually beyond us because it is divine. Now, we can think of Kierkegaard's work as being a sort of extended meditation on the problems of faith in the modern age. Kierkegaard is without a doubt the most important theologian since Pascal, and uh, it's would be interesting to speculate what his favorite books of the Bible are. Very clearly he likes the story of Abraham. Very clearly he also likes the story of Job. But he seems to gravitate towards the most negative and difficult and disappointing passages in Scripture. So if you think you have a script, you find a scriptural resonance in his work, I strongly urge that you look back at the Bible. This will inform your reading of that and it will make your interpretation of Kierkegaard much easier. You will find that he is among the most oblique and difficult to of writers, he intends to be difficult. He is going to make you work for the insights that you glean from him. If you do not have enough desire, enough passion for the truth to break a 600-page book of fragments, well then, you're not the kind of reader he wants to talk to. He is an individual that means to talk to other individuals. He means to turn you into an individual, not one sheep among the flock. He wants you to confront your own soul and the nature and the true facts of the human condition. This will be agonizing, this will be difficult, this will call upon all of your spiritual resources, but it is your only chance to be a real human being. I might be tempted to say that Kierkegaard's work can be thought of as an extended meditation on the parable of the rich young man. Those of you that know that, it's in the synoptics. The rich young man comes to Jesus and he thinks very highly of himself, and he says, what do I need to do, Lord, in order to gain the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus says, obey the law and the commandments, and leave me alone. And the rich young man comes back and says, look, I already obey the law and the commandments, please. Tell me what I really need to do. Give me something spectacular. Obviously, the rich young man is engaging in this religious adventure because he finds it interesting and entertaining, because he is still mired in things of this world. So Jesus, immediately diagnosing the spiritual condition of this rich young man, and Kierkegaard is diagnosing the spiritual condition of the West, says, fine, I have a good retort for you. Go, sell all you have, and follow me. And that quieted the rich young man down. And he shrugged his shoulders and left and said, look, I wanted something fun and kind of adventurous, but I didn't want to put everything up. And if you do not have the faith which will wager everything on the outcome of your criterionless choice, then you are not really um, willing to, to do what is necessary to turn yourself into an individual, to turn yourself into a Christian. One of his books was called Training in Christianity, the idea being that you don't become a Christian all at once. It is not an overnight thing, although you will be infused with God's grace perhaps all at once. Being a Christian is not an event. It is a process. You gradually come to understand what the domain of your will is, and you do your best to reconcile your will with God's will to humble your, your arrogant tendency to judge God. He is, go he is driving at the idea that we must put everything up and that the legacy of Western rationality has been an impediment to our religious salvation. Now, I would be tempted to say that Kierkegaard is a serious jester, and this will harken back to a, an argument that I was making earlier when I talked about Shakespeare. Comedy is the Christian literary form. And Kierkegaard, for all his unpleasantness and unkindness and kind of weirdness, is a great theological joker. When he writes down things, when he writes things like, I am a missionary, I'm bringing Christianity to Christendom, obviously he has a great sense of humor, which is, again, a very peculiar thing in a man that seems so chronically depressed as Kierkegaard, as someone that seems so alienated and isolated and alone. How is it that this can work? And may I say that we might make an, uh, an observation or an analogy between Kierkegaard and the fool in King Lear, if any of you know that play. The fool in King Lear is a fool, and yet at the same time, he says witty and pregnant and important things that are enigmatic and subject to a variety of interpretations, but are always important for the further development of what's going on in the play. May I suggest that Kierkegaard is 
like Lear's fool. He asks strange and pregnant questions that no one had thought up before. And if his answers are not satisfactory, these questions are with us to stay. In other words, I'd be inclined to say that what Kierkegaard adds to the tradition of Western thought is not a set of theological answers. He is the most unsystematic of theologians. I'd be tempted almost to call him an anti-theologian. But although his answers are not entirely plausible or not entirely satisfactory, the questions that he proposes are with us today. How shall we find a way out of our mundane, prosaic lives? Is there any way in which we can have certainty about religious matters? Is it possible for us to make a leap of faith, or has the advent of the age of the machine cut us off from the possibility of religious illumination? All of these questions are forced upon us by the demonic jester, Soren Kierkegaard. Um, he, uh, when he lets his mask down, those small fragmentary occasions in which Kierkegaard tells us something about himself, he is almost always disarming in his irony and in, in his candor. And I'd be inclined to say that Kierkegaard, while he is repulsive and repellent, is in fact a catalyst towards future theological discoveries and thought. Uh, many of the great 20th century theologians and 20th century philosophers have been beholden to Kierkegaard. There are so many of them, like Marcel or Niebuhr. But in addition to people like that, there's also, I think, a tradition of secular thought that is Kierkegaardian. When you if you decide to, to move in the opposite direction, if you decide to make a leap of faith, but not towards religion, but away from religion, what you will generate from that is the tradition of 20th century atheistic existentialism. So Kierkegaard is the source of both atheistic and theistic existentialism, and his questions continue to be live questions in contemporary moral philosophy. The comedy with which he couches his questions is the thing that makes his questions most uh, accessible and pleasant. And I'll leave you with a, a statement that Kierkegaard made about his own work and about the work of Socrates and about the work of Western comedy in general. And it is pregnant with many important implications for our understanding of the tradition of Western philosophy and Western literature. If it is true, as I said before, that comedy and Christianity have an inextricable bond and that in fact the Christian literary form is comedy, well then Soren Kierkegaard Kierkegaard's dark comedies are the most modern form of this Christian kind of an art form, and maybe we would be inclined to call even his ostensibly philosophical works, works of philosophical comedy. And if we bring into the fact that he has this morbid introspection and constantly negative stance towards the world, I think we'll be able to appreciate the statement that he made when he was talking about comedy and talking about jokes. And he said that it is probably the case as was true with Socrates and other great religious thinkers that, quote, melancholy men have the best senses of humor. <laughs>